Good morning, church. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I'm so glad you are here. I'm so glad that we are able to experience this day, this resurrection day together. So let's, let's dig into God's word together, okay? Sometimes, you guys, things don't go according to plan. We know this, right? I listened to this letter received by one of the higher-ups in management, somewhere either in the insurance industry or the construction industry. Um, you may have heard this letter or some variation of it before. One source that I saw said it's been around since the 1930s, okay? But I, I've not been able to verify its accuracy or its historicity, so I would guess that it may have been fabricated or just embellished just a little bit here and there. But, but th this, is, this is the letter. It says, Dear Sir, I am writing in response to your request for additional information in block number three of the accident reporting form. I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You asked for a fuller explanation, and I trust the following details will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over, which when weighed later were found to weigh 240 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley which was attached to the side of the building on the sixth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into it. Then I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 240 pounds of bricks. You will note on the accident reporting form that my weight is 135 pounds. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equally impressive speed. This explains the fractured skull, minor abrasions, and the broken collarbone, as listed in Section 3 Accident Reporting Form. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley, which I mentioned in paragraph two of this correspondence. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of the excruciating pain I was now beginning to experience. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Now devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankles, broken tooth, and several lacerations of my legs and lower body. Here, my luck began to change slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks, and fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, as I lay there on the pile of bricks, in pain, unable to move, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my composure and presence of mind and let go of the rope. And I lay there watching the empty barrel begin its journey back down to me. <sighs> not a good day. and Definitely didn't go according to this guy's plan, right? You guys, sometimes things don't go according to plan. And that brings us to our real life action story today, the story of Jesus' resurrection. Please, if you have a, a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 20 and follow along with us. So the disciples and other followers of Jesus knew firsthand the truth of that statement. That sometimes Things don't go according to plan. Check it out. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. Mary had a plan. This was Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, which was a, a small fishing town on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And the gospel writer Luke gives us this glimpse into Mary's earlier life in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Luke says, Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them 
were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Also Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Well, you see, the trajectory of Mary's life had been forever altered by the one called Jesus. Where once there was darkness and a mind filled with the tormenting voices of seven evil spirits, Jesus brought peace and clarity and purpose. And so Mary intended to show her gratitude to her Lord by supporting Jesus and his disciples in whatever way she could along with the other women. So her plan was to be faithful to her Lord no matter what. Even when the Romans arrested him, put him on trial and crucified him. She was faithful. Three out of the four gospel writers record her by name as being one of the few at the foot of the cross while Jesus was being crucified. It wasn't her plan, I'm sure, that he would die so soon, the victim of false accusations and a mock trial. But now that it had happened, her plan was to continue to be faithful in any way she could. And that is why she showed up early in the morning with spices in hand to anoint the body of her Lord and Savior. But sometimes things don't go according to plan. And when she arrived, she saw the stone had been removed from the entrance and that it was empty. So verse 2 says she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. The other disciple outran. Peter reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who'd reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Folks, Peter and John had plans. Both of these guys were fishermen. They both had brothers. Peter's brother was Andrew. John's brother was James. And their brothers were fishermen with them. And no doubt, their plan had been to continue fishing the Sea of Galilee for the rest of their lives to provide for their families. But then one day, this traveling rabbi called the four of them to come and follow him and learn how to fish, not for fish, but for people. And as they got to know this man called Jesus, and they listened to him, and they watched him heal people and perform other incredible miracles, they realized this is the Messiah, the one who was prophesied to come and set his people free. So they followed him for the better part of three years, listening to his every word, watching his every move, doing the best they could to soak up as much of his wisdom and spirit as they possibly could, and thinking that one day, Jesus was going to call on them to step up to the plate, to gather the troops, so to speak, and to lead the charge against the Romans and the occupation of Israel. But now he was gone, dead, crucified, and with him all those hopes and dreams of a restored Israel. The guys like Peter and John were in shock. And then to top it all off, Mary shows up freaked out because the stones rolled away and the tomb is empty. They couldn't even let him rest in peace. So Peter and John jumped up, ran to the tomb to see for themselves. And I got to imagine that their grief and some anger must have brought tears to their eyes, making it harder for them to see as they ran. And when they got there, they found things just as Mary had said. The body was gone. Scripture says that John saw and believed, but, but based on the context, I got to think that means he believed what Mary had said about the tomb being empty because the next line says they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Jesus dying, even rising from the dead, this was not part of Peter and John's plan. But sometimes things don't go according to plan. 
So Peter and John returned to the place where they were staying, probably scratching their heads or their beards the whole way. But Mary, who had arrived after they had got there to the tomb, stayed behind for a while. And at this point, they had no plan. I mean, the one thing, the one person that had brought meaning and purpose to their lives had been ripped away from them, killed at the hands of the Romans and the Jewish religious leaders, and now his body even stolen away. Have you ever been there? I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced disappointment at different levels, but I'm talking about the depths of despair where your plans have been inexplicably snuffed out and you are left there holding a bag of empty hopes and dreams. Have you ever been there? That's where Peter and John were. That's where Mary was as she remained behind. Verse 11 says that Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. You see, Mary had been planning to anoint her Savior's body with spices and perfume that morning. But sometimes things don't go according to plan. Verse 19 says, on, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So the disciples, the disciples were planning to continue to grieve under the radar as best they could. Sometimes things don't go according to plan. Okay, I want you to keep your fingers in your Bibles here for a moment. We're going to come back to the story, but let me just jump ahead for just a a quick moment to present day. Okay, I've been saying that sometimes things don't go according to plan, and I'm guessing you've probably experienced that yourself. You guys, I spilled my coffee this morning on my sermon folder. Okay, not according to plan. And you guys, I want you to know that that the folks down in the family center, they didn't get to hear our wonderful worship music this morning because the sound wasn't working in the family center. Not according to plan. Several weeks ago, I had a plan for this series of messages for about five or six weeks just about Jesus. Right in a row, leading up to and including Easter, guess what? Two weeks of quarantine and sickness threw my plan right out the window. Here's another example. The last 12 months didn't go according to my plan. Go any, according to anybody else's plan in the room? I hope nobody raises their hand. Okay, thank you. I mean, let's face it. We all have plans. I have a plan. You have plans. Even our enemy, the devil, has a plan. And you guys, he's been working that plan since the Garden of Eden, doing anything and everything he possibly can to separate humanity from the creator who made us and who loves us so incredibly deeply. And when he saw, when our enemies saw that God was putting together a plan of redemption, the enemy threw everything at that plan he possibly could to try to knock it off track. Sent enemies and foreign nations and disease and calamity, anything and everything that God would allow to try and keep the plan 
from happening. He even tried to kill the baby Jesus there in Bethlehem, the Savior that God had sent as Redeemer. But Satan also learned sometimes things don't go according to plan. Unless, unless it is God's plan. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. And if that is the case, folks, there is nothing and no one anywhere, not even including the devil, that can mess with God's plan. You guys, you understand that God's plan began at the fall in the Garden of Eden, maybe even before. God's plan was 4,000 years in the making. God's plan was timed perfectly. God's plan was unstoppable, even by the mightiest nations on the planet. Places like Egypt and Babylon and the Philistines and the Roman Empire. God's plan of redemption is complete. And God's great plan, you guys, was providing the perfect life in Jesus to pay for our sins with his death and resurrection. Now get this, our part in God's plan is really pretty small. It's simply belief, simply faith. Check out verses 24 and following John chapter 20. It says that Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. You guys, Thomas was old school. All right. I mean, he would fit in very well with our modern day scientific community. He had to have facts and evidence before him and a lot of it before he would believe something. OK, so when Jesus finally stood there before him in person, Thomas could do nothing but fall on his knees and cry out, my Lord and my God. But I believe The gospel writer John included this part of the story as much for what comes next as as it was for what Thomas said and experienced there. Check this out, verse 29. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. At least I hope it is all of us in the sound of my voice today. Those who have not seen him face to face and yet have believed. Belief, that's our part in God's great, incredible, unstoppable plan. You know, my wife and I, uh, Carrie, we've been, we've been re-watching the first season of The Chosen And you guys, I mentioned this to you uh, a while back. The Chosen is a TV series made about the life of Jesus set in the old old days, I mean, back in first century church, right? And you guys, it is the best best retelling of the life of Jesus any movie or TV series I have ever seen. You should check it out when you get home, okay? The Chosen, all right? But anyway, in the series, in one of these episodes, there's a conversation that that takes place between John and... And Nicodemus, the Pharisee. And this conversation in the, in the show is right out of John chapter 3. And in that conversation, Jesus referred to a time in the Israelites' history while they were wandering in the wilderness. And one of the many times that they disobeyed God. And so God allowed venomous snakes to come, come along through the people and start picking them off one by one. So God gave Moses this very interesting instruction. He said, I want you to make this bronze serpent and put it up on a pole, and put that pole in the middle of the camp. And then anyone who looks at the bronze serpent will, if they've been bitten, they will survive. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus this story, reminding him of this, which, of course, Nicodemus knew because he was a Pharisee, right? But all that because he went on to say, just like that serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And you guys, from our limited 
human knowledge and scientific perspective, neither one of these cures makes sense. I mean, think about it. A bronze snake on a pole curing a snake bite doesn't make sense. I mean, and now think about this one. A man hanging on a Roman cross can cure the sins of all humanity? How is that possible? Again, according to our our human knowledge, scientific perspective, not possible. But it is possible when you factor in God's sovereignty and his unstoppable plan to bring about our salvation through his plan of redemption. That's why the Bible was written, to lay out God's plan. Which brings us to the the last two verses this morning from John chapter 20. Verses we've been working on to memorize for the month of March. It says that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Have you ever put those two verses in the context of the Easter story before? This is why. John told all these things, and he ends this chapter with this. I've told you all this stuff, but what you need to know is that I've told you these so that you may understand that Jesus is the Messiah, and you may believe in him. You guys, our plans often don't go according to plan. But God's plan always does. So what we need to ask ourselves is this. Am I going to cling to my plans knowing they often fail? Or am I going to fully embrace God's plan? I mean, on a personal level, are, are you going to cling to your plans over the next 12 months knowing how rocky the last 12 months have been? Or are you going to embrace God's plan for your life? You know what? It may take you unexpected places. There may be curveballs that you didn't see coming, but that could still be all part of God's plan when you're embracing his plan. And on a, on a family of faith level, are we going to cling to our own individual plans the way we want things done? Or are we going to embrace God's plan for our church? How do we know the difference? How do we know the difference between our plan, God's plan? First of all, We need to pray. we got to start there. Pray for the Holy Spirit to shower us with God's wisdom and courage and unity as we begin walking out his plan for our church. You guys, as Americans, let's face it, we tend to jump first and ask for directions later, right? And we do. We just do. But I have to wonder, what would have happened in a first century church if Peter had gotten antsy waiting for the Holy Spirit, and decided, you know, he's going to rally the the rest of the disciples, rally the guys. They're going to go off on their own little crusade rather than waiting in the upper room for the Holy Spirit. What would have happened? i got to imagine that their effort would have fallen flat on their faces. We must be careful to wait for the Lord and wait on the Lord. We dare not jump ahead of him. And then secondly, after we've spent considerable time in prayer, then we need to start acting on what we know from Scripture. We begin with Jesus' instructions to his followers, instructions like the great commandment, Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then also the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Folks, our our world is changing so, so quickly. Uh, We no longer have to walk from town to town on foot. Can I get an amen for that? Are you thankful for that? We no longer read God's word on parchment scrolls passed from church to church. The gospel of Jesus Christ, God's unstoppable plan of redemption has not changed one bit from that first Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago, okay? But 
the means of delivering the gospel have changed considerably. And that, too, is part of God's unstoppable plan. You guys, we, we now have Bibles in book form, right? And, and most families, most, house, most Christian households in America have at least one Bible at home per person, if not more, right? Would you agree with that? Okay, at least one. And then we also have Bible now in digital form. And you can, you know, pull it up on your computer at home. You could take it with you wherever you go, on your phone or whatever, whatever your device is. But even so, you guys, there are still many groups of people in our world today that don't have a single copy of the Bible in their language. That needs to change. That's God's plan for those people to know the good news also. You know, it used to be that you'd have to walk some distance to hear some traveling preacher to preach, you know, the gospel to you. And now you can hear the good news from any one of thousands, if not millions of preachers, if you get online. God's word is getting out there. I said earlier that God's plan of redemption is complete, and that's true. There is nothing more that it needs to be complete in the work of redemption. However, his plan is not yet totally finished because there are many more who need to hear the good news. Many more in our world. And one element of God's plan is that we, those of us who are Christ's followers, are to be active in spreading the good news using all the gifts, all the time, all the abilities, all the resources that God has put at our disposal to do so. You guys, to not do so would be a gross violation of the responsibility God has given to us as the stewards of his stuff. That's what we are. We're stewards of his stuff. So what's it going to be the next 12 months? Your plan or God's plan? You know, a plan that climaxed 2,000 years ago with Jesus' victory over sin and the grave the resurrection of Jesus. Guys, I hope that you will join me in this next year in both discovering and implementing God's plan in this church, in our community, in our world, in this chapter of history. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this time that we could share together in your presence. Father God, we want to thank you so much that your plan is unstoppable and that you thought of us when you were creating that plan. And God, I am so thankful that you've made it possible for us to gather to hear, here today to hear about your plan. And God, I want to thank you also that you have made it possible for us to reach others with your plan. God, you've given us a voice. You've given us the ability to write, to speak, to share with other people. And I pray that you would enable us and empower us to do that in the days ahead as individuals and as a church community. God, may we plug fully into your plan. May we put aside our plans, God, and fully adopt your plan as our plan in the days and years to come. God, we love you so much. We pray all these things in your precious holy name. Amen.